Welcome to CTI Online. I'm Holly Batista. My husband and I are the lead pastors here at CTI, and we are so happy that you're here with us. CTI is here to help you find and follow Jesus. So no matter where you are or what you're going through, we pray that this message has something special for you. I encourage you to receive whatever God has in store for you today. Well, today uh, I'm going to be sharing a message on one of our house values. And today we're going to be talking about how we call out the greatness in the next generation. That's an opportunity for you to cheer right there. We love this next generation. In this house, we believe that God has a special place for our kids and for our youth. We believe that they're not the church of tomorrow. How many know that they are the church of today? right? They're not one day going to be called by God. They've already been called by God. And we believe that they're a gift and that they are an important part of who we are as a church. You know, God has blessed this house. Look around you today. God has blessed us in this house with a diversity of ethnicities and cultures, but he's also blessed us with multiple generations coming together to bring him honor and glory. And the beautiful part of generations that come together in unity is is that everyone is necessary. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're important. It's not that one generation is more valuable than the previous generation. And it's not that we love younger people of the house more than we love older people of the house. And listen, I'm not even going to define who's young and who's old. It's subjective. You can put yourself in whatever category you want today. The most important part of this is that every generation comes together, that we are united as one body, and that all of us collectively are doing our part to raise up the next generation to take their place in what God has called them to do. Amen? And that's, listen, that's simply a biblical approach to generational ministry. Would you stand with me this morning as we read God's word and open up to the book of Psalms? Again, we've been hanging out there uh, for a while now. Um, but David, under the anointing and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says these words in Psalm 145, verses 3 through 7. He says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Look at verse four. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I, I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness, and they joyfully sing of your righteousness. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we live Lift you up today as the one true God and the one true King. And Father, I thank you that you have assembled a body of believers of every generation, Lord God, to come and to declare that you are good and your love endures forever. So speak to us today through the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated this morning. You know, uh, we've shared a lot, Holly and I, about how uh, we are raising our children and our kids are, they're growing up very fast, way too fast. And we now have a son that is going into junior high. And so if you'd like to pray and fast with us, uh, we would welcome you to do so. We would appreciate that very much. And maybe that's not a big deal, right, to some of you in the room. Maybe you're an empty nester, and maybe you've already raised your children, or maybe your kids are in college, okay? But for Holly and I, we instantly feel old, okay? And something happened recently to where my title has changed because my sixth grade son, who used to refer to me as dad, now he calls me bro, And at first, I was a little turned off by that, okay, because I thought that was disrespectful. But he's not speaking disrespectfully. Honestly, I think he's using it as a term of endearment, okay? And so I'm just kind of going with that. I'll, I'll be your bro if you want me to be your bro, but there's definitely moments where I'm going to be your dad, all right? But what really has confused me is that the other day, I actually heard him refer to my wife as bro, and so that's just really interesting. I'm trying to kind of make that connection there. 
But what's making us feel even older is that he's using all of these words and this language that we don't even understand, okay? He's telling me that certain things are cap. That's cap. Like sometimes I'll just be like, no cap? And then I'll say like, you're mid. And I'm like, what do you mean you're mid? And then he's like, you know what? That's a little sus. And then sometimes when we're having a conversation, he'll respond with bet, bet. And as I've been learning what all of these things mean, because he's defining them for me so I can get the interpretation on that, right? My biggest takeaway from all of this is that someone created a whole new language with only three-letter words, okay? They're all three-letter words, okay? But I'm doing my best to track with him and to stay relevant, right? Even though uh, I may have just, this is a new one, taken the L, right, with some of the younger people in the room, right, which... Everyone who's old like me, that means taking the L basically means that you're a loser, right? Okay? And that's actually a one-letter word now instead of a three-letter word. But this world, this world that we live in, we love to divide ourselves up, right? And you see it in so many different ways, right? There are these separations and these divisions of all kinds that exist in our societal structure. And as we approach the election, right, in the next couple of months, we see the dividing of, of two different sides in our world. We see conflicts that are taking place overseas in the Middle East and in Europe and Asia, right? We see all of these things, but we also see a divide in the generations. We love to put people into categories. We love to make distinctions between two different groups. But what David says here in the Psalms is that there's a picture of what a healthy relationship between two different generations should look like. And that health is achieved by coming together and one generation declaring or commending, right, the works of God to the next generation. In this case, it's the older generation to the younger generation. Now, why? Why does it have to be in that order? Well, it's because the older generation has seen and experienced the faithfulness and the goodness of God. The older generation has seen God move. If you've walked with the Lord for any number of years, you have first-hand experience. You've been an eyewitness to the things that God is capable of doing. How many people in the room could testify today that God has provided for you? God has protected you. God has answered your prayer. He's moved mountains that stood in your way. How many people have experienced the miracle of God this morning, right? And so we know, we know that that's who our God is and that's what he does, but we also we also have a responsibility to share that with a generation who may not know it because they don't know as much as you do and they haven't experienced as much as you have. And so if we don't communicate his wonderful works, if we don't tell of his mighty acts, if we don't celebrate his abundant goodness, how in the world are they going to know? We have to come alongside of them and we have to pour into them. But what does this really look like? And for the parents that are in the room, what does this look like? For the spiritual mothers and fathers in the room, what does that look like? For those of you in our church who are currently serving on our next-gen serve team, what does that look like? You know, in the Old Testament, we find this biblical model for generational ministry. And we're going to explore it today with two very familiar men in the scriptures that display the importance of generational ministry in their lives, but also in their leadership. We're going to look at Moses and Joshua. Both of these men were chosen by God to lead the nation of Israel. First, it was Moses. And then after Moses, it would be Joshua. And throughout their leadership, Israel was went through so many different seasons. Some of them were good seasons, and some of them were very difficult and challenging seasons. And if you're familiar with the scriptures, you might know that although Moses would lead the people out of slavery in Egypt and he would lead them to the promised land, he wouldn't actually be the one to lead them into the promised land because Joshua would be Moses' successor to be the leader that God would choose to lead his people into the promised land. But before that transition would take place, Joshua would have an opportunity 
to serve alongside of Moses. And he would learn lessons from him that would set him up to be successful when God said, now it's your time to lead. And so we're going to look at three different pictures. I'm sure stories that some of us in the room might already be familiar with. But I want us to ask ourselves some questions today as we approach generational ministry in our church and in our homes. And so if you're taking notes, I'm going to ask you to write down three questions as we go through the service today because the truth is no matter how old you are or how young you are you should always be making room for the next generation to rise up the first picture that we're going to look like look at is found in exodus chapter 17 turn there in your bibles with me uh, if you would and it says this in verses 8 through 13 it says the amalekites came and attacked the israelites at rephidim Moses said to Joshua, choose some, men, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And look at verse 10. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. But read with me, if you will, verse 13, so so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Now, listen, we reference this story quite frequently, okay? Usually when we talk about this, we're talking about supporting leadership. And we'll say, you know what? God, send someone. Send someone to hold up their arms. And that's an accurate picture of what this means because Moses was very much the leader. And he didn't hold his arms up alone. He did have help. And the Bible tells us that whenever Moses' hands were raised, there would be victory. But then as he lowered them, there was defeat. And so, yes, he needed the help. He needed the assistance to remain steadfast in this. And I don't know about you. But every time I've ever heard this preached or I've ever heard it taught or I've ever heard it referenced, I've always heard about Moses. I've always heard about Aaron and her who held up Moses' hands. But it's usually a story about three people on top of a mountain. And I think that sometimes we actually overlook the fact that there was a fourth key character in this story. And it was Joshua who was the one that was on the battlefield doing the fighting. And yes, he was the youngest out of all of them, but he was a fighter. And perhaps that's why Moses chose Joshua to be the general who would lead the army into battle. The first question I want you to write down and I want you to ask yourself today is who are you bringing to the battle? See, Moses chose Joshua, which is interesting because Moses and Joshua, they came from two very different backgrounds and two very different generations. We know how Moses grew up. Moses grew up in a palace, right? He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter, while Joshua, Joshua was raised by people who were actually slaves in Egypt. You couldn't really ask for two different people with two completely different backgrounds, but when they came together, they became a powerful force that God used mightily. And in this picture, They had two different roles. Moses was not on the battlefield. He was on top of the hill. And Joshua was not on top of the hill. He was down on the battlefield. But coming together, they accomplished something that was greater. Let me ask you again this morning, who are you bringing to the battle? Because there are younger people in our church, there are younger people in your home that don't know what you know and they don't have the wisdom or the depth of experience that you have. They might not even have the spiritual maturity that you would like them to have just yet. And listen, that's okay because what they do have is energy. They have resilience. They have stamina. And what they can do is they can make a contribution to something if you chose to bring them with you to the proverbial battlefield of living for Jesus in this dark world. You see, the battle, the battlefield, that's where they learn. 
That's where they grow. That's where they see God move and, and God brings breakthrough and victory. We just read a moment ago in Exodus 17, I believe it was verse 13 that says, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army, right? But he didn't do it by himself. Moses was a critical part of this. And it wasn't just that Moses' arms were lifted up in the air. That's not what it was only about. You know what it was? It was about a posture of prayer. Moses had his hands lifted in prayer and in intercession while the army of Israel was being led on the battlefield by Joshua. But there was this direct correlation between Moses' prayer and Joshua's victory. And when it comes to championing the next generation, God is calling us to partner with them and to be their intercessors and their encouragers and their coaches and their support system to speak life into them and to fan the flame inside of them. We need to invite them to the battlefield and allow them to step up. We have to open up doors for them now and not later. We have to give them leadership opportunities now and not later. The church needs the gift that's on their life now and not later. And we're the ones that have to make room for them and bring them with us to battle. Would you allow me just for a moment to make this personal? Because this is very personal for me. As many of you know, I grew up in this church. I was born and I was raised here. I'm a product of this house. And the reality is that there are many people here, some of them in this room, who called out the greatness in me. You see, now in no way am I trying to make myself the hero of CTI because Jesus is the hero of CTI. I'm not. In no way am I trying to make this about myself. But the reason why this is so personal to me is because I was invited to step out onto the battlefield as a young person. When I was a kid, I had opportunities to use my gifts in this church. As a matter of fact, when I was six years old, I was in a musical that the kids presented and right over here, on the platform, I said my very first words in that, on this platform when I was six years old. I, I spoke on this platform in a play. When I was a teenager, I started leading worship in youth ministry. And can I tell you something? I wasn't that good. There were people who could sing better than me and who could play better than me. But I was invited by my leaders and my pastors to serve in that way. As a teenager, I had opportunity to preach and to serve in kids ministry. I had opportunity to work at Camp Calvary as a camp counselor. So that was my first job. And then fresh out of Bible college, I was hired here to be part of the pastoral team at the age of 21. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Can I be honest with you? I didn't know anything after four years of Bible college. I had a piece of paper that said I now had a degree. But this is where I really started to learn and to grow. And then about six years ago, you all elected me to be the lead pastor of CTI, and I was still young. I was only 32 years old, and guess what? I wasn't the most experienced, and throughout all of this journey, there have been leaders before me, my parents before me, people older and more experienced than me who have believed in me and encouraged me and brought me with them to the battle and let me use the gifts that God had given me. I can't imagine what my life would have been like if there weren't people before me that made room and created space for me. If there weren't opportunities to serve in ministry, my life would probably look completely different. And that's what we're called to do in this house. We're making room for the next generation and calling out the greatness that's inside of them. For Joshua and for Moses, it wasn't just the work on the battlefield. As a matter of fact, there was something far more important that Moses included Joshua in, and that was encountering God. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 33 as we look at another snapshot. It says this in verse 7, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and they worshiped each, each at the entrance 
entrance to their tent, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And listen to what it says here at the end. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. You know, I'm not sure that anyone that we read of in Scripture ever walked more intimately with God than Moses. You see, we have to first understand what the tent of meeting signified in the Old Testament time period. This was the place where God encountered his people before the tabernacle was constructed. As the people of Israel traveled throughout the wilderness on their way to the promised land, this tent was portable, it would move with them, and Moses would go in, and God would meet with him, and this was exclusive. This was exclusive only for Moses as the leader of his people, but because Joshua was Moses' aid, and he had to go everywhere that Moses went, Joshua had a front row seat to those encounters. And really, it's because of Moses, who was older, that invited Joshua, who was younger, into those moments of encounter with God in the tent of meeting. Second question, write this down. I want to ask every one of us this question. Who are we taking into the tent. Obviously, this tent is figurative now because we're living under a new covenant. We are a New Testament church. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And God doesn't designate his presence to a tent or to a tabernacle or to a building or a structure like 1111 Preakness Ave. How many know that his spirit lives and dwells on the inside of us? We are the tent of meeting. We are the temple now. Each of us who have received Jesus Christ as Savior, we have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling on the inside of us, and we're called to continually encounter the Lord daily, dwelling in his presence. But the beauty, the beauty of living in community with one another is that we can also experience and encounter God together. Can I tell you that that's why you got out of bed on a rainy Sunday morning to come and sit in one of these seats. That's why you woke up this morning and logged on to our our feed to join us online. That's what our worship is. We are coming together, and you know what? You and I, we should always be inviting others to encounter the Lord with us, but when it comes to the next generation, this is crucial. We can't just communicate how good God has been to us or communicate what we have experienced of the Lord. We have to bring the next generation alongside of us and with us so that they can taste and see that God is good for themselves. Moses didn't tell Joshua how important it was to be in the presence of God. He modeled it. And more than that, he invited Joshua to come along with him. He took him by the hand. He took him into the tent. And what did that accomplish that cultivated within him a hunger Joshua had a hunger the Bible says that when Moses was done when Moses left the tent to go back to the people the Bible just told us that Joshua lingered there he stayed there a little bit longer even than Moses he developed a desire for the presence of God and he was so enthralled by the presence of God he didn't want to leave he just sat there in awe let me tell you personally I am blessed as I mentioned a moment ago to have parents who love the Lord and serve him. And as I grew up here in this house, I had pastors and I had leaders that I had great proximity to. I believe that I sat under some of the best teaching and preaching ever because CTI has always been blessed in that area. But I have to be honest, all of these years later, I don't remember every sermon that was preached. I don't remember every word that was said. I don't remember everything that was uttered in language. But what I do remember, I remember what I saw in their life. I remember their example. I remember the times that they prayed for me. I remember times around this altar. I remember watching my leaders worship. I remember observing how my parents loved Jesus and served him. Parents in the room, can I remind you today that your kids are watching every single thing that you do. They are very observant, and you have the unique opportunity for a very limited amount of time. Somebody who's an empty nester, say amen, right? 
for a very limited amount of time to show them that daily time in God's presence is valuable. Being in God's house on Sunday is valuable. They're not going to remember every word that you speak to them. And the truth is, they're probably not even listening half the time. Let's be real. But what they will remember is the example that you set for them. And this is why we have to make sure that we're creating opportunities to show this next generation how to practice his presence. We have to invite them into moments of encounter so that they will learn to crave it for themselves. Listen, as Moses drew closer to the Lord, in turn, Joshua drew closer to the Lord because Moses led the way into the presence. And we can lead people into serving on ministry teams, and that's good. We could lead people on missions trips. I'm so thankful for the Royal Family Kids Camp team that just got back on Friday. Listen, we can lead people in outreach. I'm thankful for CTI Hope that served this morning already and is about to go serve again down in Patterson. But we can lead people on outreach and mission and service. But the most important place that we will ever lead people is into his presence. It's the most important place. The next generation, they're hungry for an authentic encounter with the Lord. They want the supernatural. They want to see signs and wonders. They need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They need power that's beyond them. Yes, they need to learn. They need to study. They need to mature. But they also need to experience him. And you learn and you grow in a classroom. But encounters, encounters with God, they take place at an altar. Or in Moses' case, in the tent of meeting. I want to challenge us all as a church, as often as you can, you bring your young people around the altar and you stand with them. You encounter God with them in your home. You come alongside of them. Don't be afraid to ask them what God is speaking to them, what God is showing them. And I would also add this, would you be humble enough to allow God to speak to you through them? Who are you taking? into the tent to encounter the Lord. My last question that I want to ask you is who are you setting up for success? You see, the reality is that none of us are going to be here forever. We know that God moves in different times and in different seasons. We know that sometimes the assignment that God has for us, that can change We also know that none of us are going to live forever. I just thought I'd encourage you with that this morning. We have to make sure that what we are building will outlast us. Because what we're part of has always been bigger than just one single generation. Remember, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of every generation. And when Moses knew that his time was coming because he knew that he wouldn't be the one who would usher the people into the promised land. God already had his successor right there waiting. It was the one that he brought to the battle. It was the one that he took into the tent. And now it was Joshua's time to step into this new role. And I want you to read with me from the book of Deuteronomy, we see in verse 30, uh, chapter 34, verse 9, it says, So Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. You see, there was this impartation. Moses had blessed Joshua. Moses had invested in Joshua. Moses had mentored him. He discipled him. He championed him. And then, then he passed the baton to him. And he encouraged Joshua. He says, you move forward. You carry this torch. Joshua was received well by the people of Israel, largely in part because Moses gave Joshua his blessing. Moses set Joshua up for success. And sure enough, 
Joshua would lead the people into that land of promise. They crossed over the Jordan, and it was under Joshua's leadership that the people of Israel finally received a land that was their own, that God had promised them long ago. And although Moses wasn't there to enjoy any of that, you bet that his fingerprints were all over the leadership of Joshua because he had set him up for success. Can I remind you today, however old you are, however young you are, as long as you're living, you are leading. If you are alive and breathing, someone, somewhere, is watching you. You are an example. You have influence. You have an opportunity to leave an imprint, an impact on someone else's life. How you lead, how you respond, how you love, the way that you serve, how you deal with disappointment and navigate the challenges that life throws at you, how you trust God in the difficult and desert seasons of your life. Someone is going to follow in your footsteps. And so we all have this great responsibility to bring others with us into the battle, to teach them that while we fight, while they fight, we also hold up our hands and we pray. We have to take them with us into that place of encounter because it's not just our encounter with God that matters but it's about them developing a hunger for the presence of God. And we have to set them up for success, which may mean that we have to create some more space for them to rise up. Just before we close in prayer, I want to share one more thing. You see, Joshua, he continued on to be a very successful leader. And you can read this in the book of Joshua in the Bible. It was the nation of Israel. They prospered greatly under him and under his leadership, and they occupied that land, that territory that God had given them, although it did not come without a fight. And as you read through the entire book of Joshua, you see breakthrough after breakthrough, victory after victory, triumph over triumph. And towards the end of Joshua, his life, he's now old, and that season is over. And if you were reading this in your Bible, you would turn from the book of Joshua to the book of Judges. And I want to read one last verse of scripture with us this morning. It's a horrible verse. I think it may be the most depressing verse in the whole entire Bible. But it's important that we understand how urgent it is to make room for the next generation now and bring them to the battle now and take them to the tent now and set them up for success now. Because after Joshua's generation, a whole new generation had risen up. And listen to what it says in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I don't know what happened. I don't know what went wrong. I don't know where they went wrong. But all I know is that when I read those verses in Judges chapter 2, it shakes me to my core. And all I know is that when we read that at CTI, we better say, not on our watch. Not my children, not my grandchildren, not my family, not at Calvary Temple International. That's unacceptable. And that will not be our story. We will see a generation rise up after us that will continue to press into the things of God. That will continue to walk out the call that God has placed on them. And we will see them do greater things than we did. And we won't be jealous or envious of that. We will celebrate that and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you that you're true to your word. Thank you that what you're building is bigger than just one generation. Thank you for being a part of the CTI online family. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you'll be the first to know when we go live or share new content. 
Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments about how this message has blessed you or if there's any way that we can pray for you. We so appreciate your time and we hope to see you again soon.